Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, the vultures are gone. I don't know what to say. They, they checked out our place. I was hoping they were going to kind of take up residence, but one came in December. All of a sudden, a mating pair showed up and they checked out the place and I think they decided the accommodations weren't good enough, so they're heading off to a Motel 6 somewhere near you. Anyway, so I, we were talking about norovirus last week. I talked with Mary Estes and she informed me that there is a new strain that has emerged in the United States, which is why uh, there seems to be a big outbreak. We're much more bigger outbreak than we've had in a long time. And of course, the FDA warned everyone that there is now a, an outbreak in oysters from Hammersley Inlet in Washington. So when you go to your oyster place and they say we have oysters from Massachusetts and we have oysters from the Gulf and we have oysters from Washington, I'd go like, Washington? <laughs> I'm not eating those. Now you may wonder where Hammersley Bay is, because I did. So this is the state of Washington, but if you look at where Hammersley Bay is, look, this is the outlet right here, right off the Puget Sound. How did norovirus get into that little remote area? You boat people have not been good. You're not supposed to be discharging waste in the Puget Sound, I don't think. But anyway, that's most likely how it happens. Anyway, MPOX is back in the news. It continues to be a problem. You remember we've talked about it over the last couple of months. Clade 1 is the serious one that is in Central Africa. Clade 2 is the less serious one that is in West Africa and the one that caused the big outbreak in 2022. Um, most people survived. The, almost everyone survives Clade 2. It's a very serious illness in Clade 1. So it's a big concern because there have been more outbreaks besides the places where it's endemic. It's endemic really in, the, in Central Africa, in the DRC, and now it appears that they're getting cases in Uganda, neighboring Uganda, and Burundi, which I've pointed out here. And if you look at the most recent maps, actually it's beginning to spread out. And there have been over 70,000 MPOX cases in 20 countries with over 1,200 deaths in 2024 alone. So the WHO and uh, everyone, CDC, is, is very concerned about that. It's only under control in five nations, in Gabon, South Africa, Morocco, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And there are 12 nations outside of Africa that reported at least one case, Canada, Germany, India, Sweden, Thailand, the UK, and the US. Five new ones this past month, Belgium, Pakistan, Oman, France, and China. China actually reports that, uh, reported a cluster of five people with clade one. One of, the pa pa one of the people was living in DRC, moved there, but the other four are all in the, in the household. So it's, it's actually a really kind of a different disease. It's really important that we're aware of it because the first case of clade one happened this past November. It was linked to someone who was traveling from the endemic region. In this country, transmission of, in non-endemic areas is mostly men who have sex with men, so it's physical contact. But in endemic regions, 75% of the cases are actually in minors because it's living in a tight uh, quarters where kids are living together, so it spreads skin to skin. Uh, but it's important for the U.S. physicians to be aware of it because you have to be prepared to recognize a case of MPOX and also how to, how to report it. It has to be reported to the CDC and the WHO and how you do that. There's not a lot of effective treatments. There was just one recently sponsored NIH trial that showed it didn't really have much of an impact. This antiviral tecoviramat didn't really have much of a change in the outcome. Uh, and so we need a lot more focusing on uh, research and ways to create a vaccine that's effective and antivirals that work. So, but it's, it's an issue to keep, uh, we need to keep watching because it is a big problem worldwide. Now, in the news. You know, I've been watching those, um, as a dog owner, I've been watching those commercials where they have somebody look at the kibble that you've got in a bag and they go like, how can you serve this to your dog? And then they go to a refrigerator and pull out fresh stuff and say like, this is the only way for your dog to be treated. <laughs> well, not so fast. Last week, a cat in Oregon died after eating Northwest Naturals cat food, a raw food contaminated product uh, they're now reca recalling batches of this because they're made with uh, turkey parts. And if LA doesn't have enough problems, there's been also bird flu found in other brands of raw pet food. Monarch raw pet food sold in farmers markets in the LA in area. 
There's been several indoor cats that have tested positive. Lily's extremely happy about that. Uh, but it, the point is that Los Angeles public health officials have warned against all consumption of all raw milk and raw meat products, especially don't feed those to your pets. So all those people go to the refrigerator, pull on, oh, this is fresh? Get a bag of kibble, <laughs> which is not going to, you know, kill your dog. You can do whatever you want with your cats. So the CDC came out with a new sort of diagram for two-year-olds on how bird flu is transmitted, and I, I like this one. It's an, it's an updated one. You see a duck, a wild duck coughing, sneezing on a poultry, on a chicken, and, and, and that's one way chickens get infected because there's contact with wild birds, and then they can infect cows, and cows are now being able to transmit it from cow to cow. Uh, people can be infected either by the chicken or by wild birds or by cows, uh, and the thing is, there has not been a lot of human-to-human -human transmission. There has been one case that is suspected human-to-human -human transmission that was in 2006. So where do we stand with bird flu? 66 cases uh, in humans, 36 uh, associated with dairy herds, uh, another 20 associated with um, poultry. And as, as I said, it's been a really devastating illness in wild birds. Uh, and the concern, of course, is that it'll jump into people. So we're watching that very carefully. I talked about the two, uh, the, the woman who died last week uh, from bird flu. So seasonal activity uh, for seasonal flu is really, really uh, picked up. Uh, nationally, the percent positivity for influenza in looking at outpatient respiratory illnesses increased. Percent of hospitalizations due to influenza increased. Uh, during the um, third week of December, public health laboratories reported that 40% of the, of the influences were H1N1 and 60% were H3N2, both of which are in the flu vaccine. So if you were smart enough to get a flu vaccine, you should be pretty well covered. We have a person who wasn't smart enough and got the flu. Uh, there have been no pediatric deaths associated with seasonal flu this last week. Uh, and, but the CDC is recommending everyone over the six months or older get an annual influenza vaccine. Uh, and there are also plenty of antivirals to treat. So we have plenty of ways to reduce the morbidity and mortality of influenza. It's mostly vaccines. And if you get sick, then antivirals. If you look at, we're really in the peak of influenza season. This is influenza in blue, RSV in, in maroon, I guess, and COVID in orange. And you can see influenza really spiking up. And the percent positivity for respiratory virus is also increasing. And here's the problem. If you look at what, the, what we need to do to control uh, influenza from spreading uh, really all over the place is that we try to get people to 70% immunity. immunity. So, the target, the target for vaccines to be really effective would be 70% of the population. If you look at these numbers, each year we have less and less and less. And in the red, you can see this year we've been running around 40%. Now, if you'll recall with COVID, we talked about that R number, the number of people you infect if you have a, a completely susceptible population and one person shows up as infected, how many people do they infect? And that determines how many people need to have immunity to prevent spread of uh, its herd immunity. And then, if you'll recall, back to, back to science, Janet, uh, our, the R number for flu is around 1.8 to 2. The R number for, for um, COVID is around 12 or 13. To, to, to calculate herd immunity, it's 1 minus 1 over R. So if, it's 50, if, if, if the number is 2, 1 minus 1 over 2 is basically you have to have 50 percent of the, of the population completely immune. Well, the vaccines provide a level of immunity, but not complete immunity, which is why the target 70%. But if we don't hit 70%, there's a lot of spread of the virus from pe person to person. Well, that's where we are. Not enough people are getting vaccinated, and we have a vaccine that, that um, actually is very appropriate for this seasonal influenza. You can see we're in the middle of the spike. Mostly it's influenza A, very little B. And if you look at what what type it is, it's mostly H3N2, H1N1. The yellow there is just not subtyped. Now, I was saying last week we were following almost the exact trajectory as, as the uh, seasonal flu in 2019, right before the pandemic. You can see the little red circles are this year. The green line is 2019. The point I, I want to make is that particular 
year, the season didn't really end until March. And so we have another two and a half months probably of a lot of influenza. So, you know, if you haven't gotten your vaccines, not too late, I'd go ahead and get vaccinated. Uh, but we're, in, we're probably going to have a season very much like what happened in 2019. Well, I showed you that COVID's picking up as well. Uh, this is the percentage of emergency visits who have COVID, and you can see we're beginning to pick up, you know, at the same time, perfectly predictable time. Hospitalizations are also increase, increasing, and if you look at wastewater activity, it's now pretty high. You can see it's really spiked in late December and January. And these are individual sites. You can see red dots mean that there's been a significant increase uh, in activity of wastewater. And it is intensely increased in Ohio and Illinois, Minnesota and Wisconsin. So there's a huge increase in the upper Midwest, also in Louisiana and Arizona for some reason. But most of the intensity is, is Ohio, uh, uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. And what's driving that is the same variant we've been talking about, XEC. That's the recombinant uh, variant. And I just, this is a very busy slide, but it's a lot of interesting information about what's happened with the evolution of the virus. So Omicron arrived in 2022. Uh, the dominant strain in 2023 was that JN1 strain. 2024, Novavax targeted that, this, the vaccine in 2024. In 2023, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines didn't match up exactly right. If you'll recall, they were to that particular one down here, XBB. What happened this, in 2024 is we developed these flirt strains, and Moderna and Pfizer targets are now the flirt strains. So that's good. And XEC is a recombinant of two different flirt strains. So that's been the 2025 probably dominant strain. So you can see this evolution of the virus uh, and the you know, the vaccines have been getting pretty close to following them, so they're very effective at protecting. The only trouble with the mRNA vaccines is they only have about six months or so of, of, of activity. The Travelers Program, not as much as, uh, as in the United States, and it's actually not as much XEC in the other parts of the country. That's the planes and airport uh, entry site, uh, sites where they look at wastewater. Still JN1.16, which was last year, is the dominant strain, so XEC seems to be mostly in the U.S. And I always like to end with TEFI, the uh, Texas Epidemic Public Health uh, Institute, because it shows what's going on in Texas in real time. And you can see big spikes in influenza, uh, norovirus, parvo-19, that's the slap cheek disease we've talked about, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, parainfluenza, which is a disease mostly of children and elderly, and just the beginning emerging of SARS. So, Lots of virus activity, classic sort of winter viruses, many different types, uh, but influenza is the dominant thing going on right now. And I'll end it, I'm going to end today with a couple of shout outs. First of all, a really important one. Congratulations to Dr. Peter Hotez, who's the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics, who re received the uh, Hill Prize in Public Health by the Texas Academy of Medicine, Engineering, Science and Technology, or TAMIS. This is funded by Linda Hill Philanthropies. The Hill Prize recognizes in, uh, top Texas innovators and researchers in six categories, and they really propel, high, support high-risk, high-reward type research. And so uh, this is one awarded in public health, and Peter is very deserving. Also, a shout-out to Dr. Nicole Provenza, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery, who received the Kumar New Investigator Award for the Nor North American Neuromodulation Society. And she... Uh, has been doing a lot of great work and will be recognized at their national meeting. And of course, finally, Lily is all prepared to root for the Texans. They've got to go to Kansas City and play in ridiculously cold weather. But we're hoping that they pull off a great victory. We hope. We're hoping for them. And of course, my favorite player, Nico Collins, had a great last playoff game. So we're, all, we're counting on Nico to bring in a win. Anyway, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you. Mm-hmm.